I'm going to be trying to go live here on Facebook. I don't know if I'm already live or not. Uh, there's Facebook gives me all kinds of weird responses. Doesn't mean we're not live. Uh, so if you just stand by, I will check and see whether we're live over there. <laughs> it's uh, such a weird world we have that, you know, in the, right now. Uh, stand by. Okay, we are live. That's uh, <laughs> that's kind of incredible. Uh, so, hi everyone. I'm Carrie Cassidy again from Project Camelot, and I'm here with Tony Gosling, and he is a former, I believe, BBC reporter and uh, investigative reporter, and he has been on my show over the years, but we haven't talked in quite some time. So it's wonderful to have you on the show again, Tony. Uh, so much has happened since we last connected, I think. Uh, so, so why don't you just talk about what you've been up to, uh, give yourself a brief introduction, mm. and uh, let's just get into it. Well, yes, yeah, so I was a radio journalist at the BBC in 1989, 90, right through to 90, and this, is, this is like an eon ago for many people, but it was a fascinating era, Kerry, because the BBC had been an extremely good organisation up till the early 90s. And the Thatcher government, uh, at the bidding of Victor Rothschild, who was still alive in the 80s, uh, said to Marmaduke Hussey, who was the BBC chairman in 1987, can you sack the director general? So the BBC director general was sacked by Marmaduke Hussey who was the chairman. His wife was the Queen's chief lady in waiting. So this is how the feudal system works. Yeah. So uh, and, and, you know, this tracing this decision to get rid of the chief editor of the BBC, who'd been very independent minded, very critical of the Thatcher government. You know, it was yeah. Victor Rothschild. Victor Rothschild is the, the fifth man. He was after Burgess, McLean, Philby. Uh, Anthony Blunt, Victor Rothschild. If you, if you, if you, if people are interested in the in the whole Cambridge spy thing, I am. Roland, Roland Perry, the Australian writer, who's now uh, he's kind of semi-retired. He's still writing, but he teaches at Melbourne University journalism. Roland Perry's book, The Fifth Man on Victor Rothschild's Life, is an unbelievable, rip-roaring read. He he had so much trouble in London. He went back to Australia after he'd written it, but. Uh, because Victor was a Labour peer, he was in the House of Lords. He was advisor to uh, Edward Heath, uh, Harold Wilson, Margaret Thatcher. All of the top government prime ministers were being advised by, you know, not by the Rothschild family, by Victor specifically. And he, okay. was, he was a Russian spy, you know. So it was right. not a Russian spy, a Soviet spy, just to get the terminology. Anyway, so... You know, the BBC had changed so much in the time I was there. I could see, you know, you're looking around, the wallpaper's changing. The best people are being um, pushed out, elbowed out, and nepotism was really starting. And, uh, uh, you know, so the, the actual standard of the production staff was going down off a cliff, really. Uh, but but the, whilst we were still there, uh, there was a fantastic amount of sharing of knowledge and, and journalism and a lot of honesty amongst the people who were working uh, in London at the time, and, and and this was just radio I was working in. So Kerry, it's you know it was a, a terrific experience, and I think for many people who are just kind of doing things like blogging uh, and alternative media now, there is something quite. Uh, I mean, we had the biggest audience of any radio station in London, we're called Greater London Radio, and when you're broadcasting on a station like that, you know you've got to get it right. You've got a, nearly a million people most of the time listening to you know, with the radio on in the background. And so you want to, you know, your reputation is made, made or failed on, on whether you've actually checked your facts and whether you've got the nous to know uh, that what you're saying is correct. So anyway, we were, we were um, 
you know, we were nobbled. You know, we were nobbled. The BBC was nobbled. All sorts of people from private industry came in, started to just, and many Zionists actually. I had a, a senior producer suddenly take over who was a raving Zionist, and, and you know, she she was from the private world. Well, you know, so we were all public servants, effectively civil servants. So that's that was my, you know, that's my big sort of introduction to mass media and so uh back in um it was around about 2008 the time of the financial crisis i i sat down with some friends and we said look this is absurd you know what's going on here is the whole destruction of democracy the principle of democracy the idea that the people should uh, have a government that can actually do things to you know that 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 aren't commercially viable uh, for example setting up things like youth centers running infrastructure at cost things like the uh, the the government run railways the electricity supply the water supply now it's all of course being sold off but we we uh, we were part of an era where these things actually worked and um and so i started in 2008 i started a weekly radio show here in bristol in england which is an interesting city in that this is where john cabot set off from uh, in 1497 to so-called discover uh, North America. And uh, and that was the beginning, of course, of this new world order, you know, or the United States. And now, of course, we're getting that in Europe. We're getting the United States of Europe. Uh, so it's an interesting spot to be, Bristol. Uh, and we've got a very good, I think, alternative culture here based around the, the summer festival scene. Uh, you know, Glastonbury, which has become hor- horrifically commercialised. But there are lots and lots of uh, travelling people, uh, vehicle dwellers, they sometimes call themselves, but people who are sort of mobile uh, and they tend to winter out in Bristol and then spend the summer on the road. Uh, so it's, uh, I think, a terrific city to live. We've got such a lot of, you know, it's a temple of port as well for it, for its sins, like Edinburgh and places like that and London, of course. Uh, and so it's got a lot of history, uh, but it's also got a terrific, I think anyway, terrific cultural life, Kerry. Okay, so now as far as where you are right now with the world scene, because we agreed that we want to talk about that. Um, yeah. Why don't you just start wherever you'd like to start with that? Look, uh, you know, we've got all these crises, Okay. The, we, here in the UK, one of the big things is the migrant crisis. So we've got uh, something like uh, every three years, another million people coming into the country, many of them just on student visas uh, or uh, because the wages that uh, businesses would have to pay them are less. And, of course, it would be easy to stop them if they wanted to. They don't want to because this is, this is uh, bringing down wages. Uh, it's also like two fingers up to uh brexit so he's saying well you know you've had brexit but look all these migrants are like goods and services we can just move them around wherever we want uh and uh, and so that is well okay what about thing. all the hotels being packed with ukrainians for example in england <laughs> well it's not yeah it's not just ukrainians yes ukrainians obviously i've noticed myself quite a lot of ukrainians around uh, not so many palestinians funnily enough uh, even though, of course, they are in a far, far worse and more difficult situation over there. But that's just one crisis. I'm giving you an example of, of the migrant crisis. We've also got the cost of living crisis, the economic crisis. We've got a, a crisis in Ukraine, um, and we've got we've had a you could call all these things. And but there is a there's a I think very important pattern that's developed, very obvious to me, through all of these things, and that is this uh, that summed up best by this term accelerationist. So the accelerationists are a group. It's a philosophy, really. It's the sort of thing which is embraced by people like Yuval Noah Harari, uh, although he doesn't really broadcast it much. Uh, I would just suggest, you know, that there is this, it's a kind of, a meet, where, it's where uh, extreme communism and the far right meet. So the <laughs> idea is we are just going to tell the public what to do. But what they're accelerating is interesting. The accelerationists want to bring about the end of the world. Well, they say that, but really what this is, is the biggest crisis possible. So the accelerationist philosophy is you you create a crisis 
and you make sure that the solution, rather than sorting the crisis out, makes it worse. Right? So, for, I mean, is the solution. Yeah, but it isn't, right? It's going right. to make things worse. So this is another example of, uh, uh, I mean, for example, in, in the United States and the UK, they're now starting to increase over the last year or so, maybe 18 months interest rates. This will make the cost of living crisis worse. It's going to increase inflation. So these sorts of solutions that are going to make things worse, Well, this it's... is the way these people operate. It's known as problem or reaction solution. And uh, David Icke made a big deal about that years ago. So it's still the same, you know, formula, if you will. But in, in your case, you're talking about the ones that actually want to send it down a, a dark path. And we certainly are seeing that at this time. Um, there's a real push for a totalitarian Nazi run uh, world government. Uh, obviously, through Klaus Schwab and the and the whole thing. So you go to Bilderberg, right? And you you sit yeah. in those meetings. Now, how do you do that? Um, you, you are an investigative reporter, but do they let you in, or, no, or are you outside? No, 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 Terry, I do not sit in the meetings. All what right. we do, we photograph them as they're going in, and actually, there's a whole whole bunch of us, I guess, uh, maybe a couple of dozen over the years of people who've really gotten together, particularly in Europe. Uh, when when you know when the uh, when, when the meetings are in Europe, it may that it probably will be this year in Europe somewhere. Where at the moment we're trying to figure it out and guessing uh, where it's going to be uh, in in um, sort of April May time. But the the point is, you you have to photograph them as they're going in and out. First of all, these quite often you can just sell the pictures of the people. Oh wow, look, you know Henry Kissinger. Obviously, he's disappeared now off the scene. But uh, you know you got these these rich and powerful people coming in and out but the thing is what is so i find so fascinating about this is sometimes you get a picture and we're sitting at the hotel in the evening we're going who is this guy i think he's look he's with them he's with them and we have to go through online to try and figure out who on earth it is they're not on the list you know there's no they're completely okay. and it turns out, for example last time uh i think his name's josh friedman who was with us uh, did an article about the guy. It's the he's the chief guy for the accession of Sweden to NATO, working for the Swedish government, the Swedish military. There he is at the Bilderberg conference, uh, just an anonymous face, no no announcement that he's actually there. But of course, this is what it's all about. They're bringing these countries into NATO. It's a military political lobby. Sure. Uh, where what they're doing is essentially they have been, and, and they've been going ever since the 1950s, remember, mm -hmm. bit by bit. And I think they've now reached a stage where they do control all of our politicians, really. So they make sure that there is no politician that's going to get in power in any of the NATO, NATO countries or countries that are coming into NATO uh, that's not one of their puppets. And they've been extremely successful, Bilderberg, in doing that with their... Um, uh, their toxic mix of the biggest, most powerful banksters, corporations, uh, royalty, of course, as well, are also in there. Sure. But the mass media people, the owners, not necessarily the actual day-to-day -day editors, the people that actually own the, uh, the media mostly are, the, are there. And they're also, what they're really doing is they're just making sure that anybody that, that is coming along as a potential leader uh, they're they're just checking them over. This person will do as we say. Yeah, they they are completely wedded to being controlled by money and blackmail. Yes, they're and they're they're able to speak, and it's a way of introducing them to the secret rulers of the Western world, if you want. It's like uh, schmoozing them, saying, "Look, with a cozy club of people, we'll look after you." It really is a sort of top level NATO mafia, Kerry. That's the way I see it. Sure. Well, yeah, it's almost a, from my point of view, it would be a coven, a large coven, <laughs> um, you know, just well, yeah, there's a few, maybe a few like coven. It is. Yeah. That, so that's the steering group, I suppose, who are the yeah. people that make the decisions about. Yeah, I mean, I mean they have very diabolical uh, ambitions uh, and, yeah. and they're not shy about announcing them to the world. So we just had a meeting uh, that happened, right? Was there anything that stuck out for you in particular? They're really focusing, I think, on AI and yeah, exactly and the right. AI, it was all about AI largely, anyway. I mean, there was there was all this stuff about growing NATO, fighting Russia, Ukraine, all this sort of thing. 
Yes. But but it was all over the news, all over Europe and the United States during the Bilderberg Conference. And, um, yeah, because what the, they see this as they, – they've been talking about this whole idea of bringing AI in, and they were switching it on, switching it off, testing it, basically. But this was one of the reasons why NATO was encouraging the Russians to invade Ukraine, was so that they could really, you know, test this out on the Ruskies. Yes. Testing weaponry is is a huge part of the Ukrainian uh, situation. I always thought that and did report on that. Uh, now, I don't know if you're aware of the of, of the the Russians going into underground bases. There's a huge network under Ukraine. Are you are you up to speed on all of that? Well, it, it, you mean uh, Russian built bases? No. Uh, actually occupied by the biolabs. Don't you remember the story? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. All the biolabs yeah, underground. Oh, and, the biolabs. Uh, yeah, that's... that's and, uh, and that's a lot of that stuff doing. was, uh, was inter, you know, interrupted, basically. But they were doing experiments on the Ukrainian people who, <clears throat> a lot of them, have now come across the channel and actually <laughs> invaded your country. So what you're going to look at is people that have been possibly even not only experimented on, but perhaps carriers and uh, genetically re-engineered in one way or another to, to bring a certain change in the population. And so that's going to affect Britain in a big way in the future. These are things they don't talk about, of course. No. Um, and then I, I also, you know, I, I, I don't want to take too much of your time today, so I am going to kind of jump from topic to topic yeah, and certainly feel free to bounce back to other things mm. if you didn't get a chance to say what you want. But I'm also curious what your take is on this latest situation with Iran, with the, the hit in Jordan. Do you think the Iranians were as involved as the news out there is trying to say they were? Um, what's your take on all of that? Well, it's it's a bit like, say, um, you know, the Nazis invading France and Britain um, taking an interest. Listen, I mean, these people are neighbours. You know, they're they're not they're not quite next door, Yemen and, and Iran, but they're very very near. Uh, the British obviously were behind the creation of Saudi Arabia in the Sykes Picot Agreement, and so that's their little monarchy that they set up, rather like the Israelis, the Crusader states over there and so these are the local indigenous people they're not they're not the puppets or the backers How, having said that uh, the united states and britain particularly are are behind israel you know so we happen to be 4000 6000 8000 miles away from israel they're next door to their uh, and this is the region that we're interfering i think it's maybe you know the, the, the pertinent question is, what are we doing in the Middle East? What have we been doing? The, the, the government that started in October, we're now looking at, um, I mean, a, a particularly horrific, I mean, it's bringing hell to the Holy Land. I was just uh, chatting to someone today about, about this, and it, what we've created in Gaza with this now nearly 30,000 by the Israeli army defense force in this extraordinary i mean is is what you've got is you've got parents who are looking at their children in the knowledge that they cannot protect their children and you've got the kids staring back at mum and dad crying so what have we what what how are we allowing this sort of thing to go on well the answer is it's not about just about land it's not about it's about good and evil and it's what the Israelis and the British and the Americans and anyone else that's involved in this, and there are some others, but it's mainly the Anglo-Zionist sort of axis, is wickedness. It's evil. It's it's biblical, really, in terms of the... Well, yeah. It, so how does, um, you know, I, I don't know what your situation is in terms of whether you get intel from sources. Do, do you have intel from sources? Well, I, I do have. I had, well, actually, my Gaza source, I'm afraid I, I cannot get in touch with her anymore. I used to get bits and bobs from her. Uh, but, I mean, I've got a particularly good source in the West Bank. So, I mean, okay. I'm always 
quit chatting with people over there about well really okay going. and what about down in egypt because it's very interesting the push to get them you know down to the south of is of gaza and then to bring in this canal you i'm sure you know the ben yeah. oh yeah canal and all of that and the fact that they are actually just i mean it's it, it's kind of mind-blowing that mm. our, the the main part of what people think of as the american government which i you know i go i'm part of what's called maga and that whole thing so i don't back any of this stuff Neither does Trump, really. So there's an issue there. And uh, how it's going to be resolved with, with or without Trump getting into office, I don't know. But we're in this very horrible stalemate on a certain level. So anything that kind of shakes loose in the Middle East is um, almost welcome at this point because the trajectory is so dire for the Palestinians. And they're, they're being obliterated. Um, and and as a state, certainly. So there's not even, you know, some people are saying two state solution. There's almost not another state anymore. There's there's a pocket and it always it has been a prison system. I guess you know that. Right. The, the, yeah. the Gazans have been in a in a prison for all intents and purposes. You know, they had to have passes to go, you know, in and out of their of Gaza and so on and so forth. Yeah, so I mean, the seventh of October was a prison break. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so no, you know, so and yet, lots of people came out. They demonstrated in the streets of all the different countries, basically trying to protest this situation. But the militaries have been completely oblivious and just going along with it. So. I know Turkey is moving troops into the area right now. I guess you've heard that, right? Well, of course, it used to be Turkey. <laughs> uh, it, up until the British turned up uh, in the First World War, just, you know, this is all Ottoman. You know, I'm sure Erdogan is looking down there, uh, you know, at old-fashioned Phoenicia, and, and which is now Lebanon, and, um, and thinking to himself, well, actually, it would be rather nice to have that back after the British pinched it from us. And of course, it is a very much a British project. If we, I was going back through the time time scales. It's unbelievable, really. The Battle of Gaza, the British General Allenby pushed all of his soldiers up. They lost about a hundred thousand men on both sides with with the Turks, and that was that was in uh, what, September nineteen seventeen, and then they finished the battle, and he pushed up, and he got pretty much level with Jerusalem. So he was kick, kicking the Turks north all the time. Um, and that was after, of course, after the Americans had come into the war. right? So the, the Americans came into leaving loads of British troops and Commonwealth troops, the New Zealanders and the Kiwis, to, to fight in, in uh, to push the Turks out of the Holy Land. And then, in, and then at the end of that year, uh, at the end of that campaign week in September, the Balfour Declaration was published in the London Times. So it's like you've taken half of the Holy Land, now let's pu publish the Balfour Declaration. Well, the next year, the Battle of Megiddo, they t they kicked the Turks right out all the way beyond Damascus uh, in a couple of weeks. And at the end of those couple of weeks, they signed the armistice with the Turks. And, well, it was, and part then, I mean, and this is, goes back, this is Lawrence of, of Arabia. It's, uh, it's depicted right, in, a, in yeah. a movie. Um, and it is a partition. It was a partitioning of an area that didn't actually have borders at the time. That's right. Um, they were tribal people, and they did um, actually move around. So, well, so right. they did have Lawrence some of on, their territories. But um, Lawrence was on the side of the Arabs, and he was doing these guerrilla yes. actions against the Germans, uh, etc. In 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 and around Palestine area. And uh, but the point is that after as the first. Uh, and uh, and then say, well, this is a religious war. Uh, why don't we just all become like New Age Luciferians? Because this is the way people really want to be. These religions have just caused so much trouble. Let's bring in a, a, a and this was <laughs> yeah, quite, that's this is the danger, idea. of course. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. that's what I mean. I don't know about you. I think that's I'm looking at what's going on, and I'm seeing all this stuff from 1871, Pike's plan. In fact, you know what I first heard about that plan. And I couldn't quite believe it. I thought, no, 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 this is nonsense. It was from a friend of mine who'd been out living with the Bedouin, who oh, were the wow. sort of 
the 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 Arabic kind of gypsy characters, the nomadic uh, traders. Sure. I mean, there's still quite a few of them around out there. She'd been staying with them for a few months. No, well, actually, maybe eighteen months, mm. and she got to speak Arabic and everything. And she came back. She said, "Oh, they're raving about this guy Pike. Who's he?" You know? Uh, <laughs> they, 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 it's almost like if you can imagine Kerry sitting around a kind of gypsy fire, chatting to the people that really know what's going on, and they're not beholden to anybody. Uh, and then they'll play a little song for you. You know, these, but, but, but that I think is 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 what we're we're dealing with today well and i've just... traveled in the middle east and and yeah. in jordan and i have actually sat around even in jericho with uh, both sides and so i can say that i you know i know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> um you know it is fascinating i mean i i kind of made friends with people um some officials at the egyptian airport who let me yeah. in their back door area to talk to me it was really interesting. Uh, nobody yeah. does that, of course, but you know they break. Most people so. don't. No, you people like you and I do. You know, mm -hmm. and you you understand that actually there is this kind of undercurrent almost everywhere you go. Yes. There's the official version. You know what? You can do exactly the same with the the Israeli archaeology departments and there sure. and the the universities over there because there is this official archaeology, uh, which they don't. You know, it's is the is the sanitized version. If you go down. Uh, you know, uh, to have a to have a proper chat with them, they will tell you, yeah, well, actually, this is right. what's really no, and that's love that's it. true behind the scenes in Egypt as well. I take tours yeah. to Egypt, and uh, I have you know some very interesting conversations. Uh, but they're you know they're afraid. These are totalitarian governments. They don't tell you that, but you know behind the scenes, Egypt was totalitarian forever, and. We were told behind the scenes, you know, nobody can talk. If they're caught talking, uh, you know, you just disappear the next day, so to speak. Yeah, so, you, have to be, you have to be quite subtle about it. It's a bit like yeah. the old uh, Soviet Russia, isn't it? You know, yeah. <laughs> but be quite careful, otherwise the KGB or the NKVD are going to, you know, going to feel your collar. Uh, yes. But anyway, you know, thankfully, we, we have, I think, one of the things I'd like to say a bit about the UK, which is big, big for us, is the um i know you're over here quite a bit but when the queen died it you know many people might think oh it's just a load of stupid british you know, actually there was a it was almost like a kind of um total change in the country a very strange mood and i don't know if you if you saw much of the coverage but there were tens of thousands of people that actually came out to line the streets to see the queen's coffin taken from london down to um windsor and and King Charles, bless him, first of all, up at Windsor, I don't know if you saw the footage of the Masonic, you know, this kind of thing that the police were doing up at Windsor, sorry, at Balmoral in Scotland. But, but yeah, so I mean, this is, this is, you know, this is what they, the police don't do salutes like that. Yeah. But anyway, that's what they were doing. Anyway, so he flew, he flew his mum down in, you know, in the coffin and which a lot of people were annoyed about because People were actually kind of thinking, oh, well, they're going to drive her down and we'll be there, you know. But the point I'm trying to say is that she was a very, very different character and personality to Charles. Charles wants to be in charge. He thinks he knows best. He's extremely political. And his mum wasn't. Well, she I'm actually hearing a completely different line of reasoning, what's going on with Charles. He's actually abdicating the, the throne at this time. He's turning everything over to William, although there may be a stand-in for a time. But um, that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing he's actually. Um, Look, but okay, so uh, let, I can okay, tell so you just... that he's not. He's he never wanted to. Uh, at least what he has said, and the actions behind the scene are that he is he is absolutely turning over the throne. So I, you know, I think you what you're saying. Sorry, that. I think what you're saying is a myth. Uh, it's a myth. It's no. a myth put out by his his lot. He really does want to be in charge. He's waited his whole the damn life to be in charge and now he is well, in charge that's an interesting line of here's an example right here's an example all right remember sunday uh we have every 11th of november uh remembering the um, where they never remember anything they forget all the lessons they've learned from all and you've got uh, king charles stood there uh behind him is rishi sunak prime minister and david cameron former prime minister right so at the end, at the end of the ceremony uh, and of course, Sunak is Goldman Sachs, right? He's a little good boy. He'll do anything he's told. 
but he's really Goldman Sachs. He's not Tory, Labour, British or anything. <laughs> so they then go off into uh, there's a great big door next to the cenotaph in Whitehall, which only opens, uh, I think, that once a year when that ceremony is. And it goes, they go in for lunch at the Foreign Office. They all march in. And these three sit down and have lunch together. So the next morning they announced David Cameron is going to be Foreign Secretary. So I, I, the, the press were going, oh, well, there was no leaks about this. This is, And I said, well, of course not. It's because they only decided yesterday. <laughs> and uh, the, Sunak, Charles, and Cameron all in there. Cameron is a big pro-Israel person. He was one of the patrons of the, uh, the uh, Jewish settlement funds, for example, you know, which is all illegal. Uh, and uh, obviously, he also in, in, he also helped arrange the destruction of Gaddafi, the invasion of uh, Libya, and all that stuff. So he was the perfect guy to have. Uh, anyway, so, so okay, so so you're saying that Cameron is the foreign secretary? Is that what you're saying right now? Oh no, did you get cut off? Oh God! All right, let's see if he comes back. I have to say that, um, you know, Tony is probably not up to speed on the information we have from the White Hats, et cetera. Uh, so so it's kind of interesting to hear his line of uh, inquiry and what he follows and what he believes versus what probably really is. So, um, however, he must have hit a nerve there because the British, you know, watch you like a hawk. Now I'm sure he's going to say something went wrong with his Internet or I don't know what. Um, it's interesting. I, I was doing a show with ML a day ago and same thing happened. It happened a lot sooner with ML, but nonetheless, uh, I'm not, this is getting to be kind of a pattern with uh, my guests <laughs> and guests, you know, that I'm the guest. Um, I'm going to do a show later today, by the way. So, so you can, um, sort of stay tuned for that um let me see it's with uh let me see who it's with uh yeah gail ross and uh i don't have her details in front of me but anyway it, it's going to be probably uh live on rumble if if uh i think that might be how it goes but we'll see i can see if i can simulcast cast it over there but um yeah it's it's fascinating I my information is that King Charles doesn't does has already stepped down. And in fact, that he may have uh, his information. Uh, I interviewed him and talk about that. He's the, the former police of uh, chief of police of Colorado. And I talked about that on my blog video that I just released a, a day or two ago. So I don't know if, if uh, Tony's going to be able to come back in whether I should <laughs> close this down. Maybe I'll take some Q&A from the audience. Uh, he is very knowledgeable. He And I think he's written a few books. I haven't actually read Tony's books, but I'm very fascinated with this uh, Fifth Man book that he mentions that I, I'd like to read that because uh, that's, that's an area that I like investigating. So let's see what's going on. I don't know. Did we, are we even live? I'm, I'm looking at, oh God. So it's, it looks like we, we're not live anymore. Um, wow. Not sure what to do. wonder if we're live. Cause I'm looking at the video on Facebook. Looks like it started over at the beginning. That's kind of insane. If anyone is in the chat and and does see me, so you're saying I am live. Okay, it's kind of weird because what I see as far as the live show is a rerun of the beginning. So I don't know what's going on there. Um, are you sure it's me like talking to you right now saying, am I live? <laughs> Maybe you can weigh in on that. Uh, Tony has disappeared. Um, let me see if there's any messages from him over here. Oh, God, it's just so insane. All 
All right, so I'm asking him uh, on the chat where we are connected, uh, if you know what's going on. So maybe he'll re respond there, maybe he won't. Uh, I think I want to keep this going for a little while longer. So if you have questions, why don't you go ahead and put them in the chat and then maybe I can answer them. Uh, it's uh, people are saying, <laughs> they're saying where they're watching it from. Okay, but that's not kind of a question. I am live and it looks like I've been on for 40 minutes. Very strange. It's not being reflected on my Facebook. Uh, okay, yeah, now, now it seems to have caught up with me. Okay, well, I'm live. So if you wanna ask a question, this is your big chance in the chat, uh, please do put a question mark after your statements, whatever it happens to be. Um, and I'm gonna try to keep this going for a little while in hopes that Tony can return. Uh, and it's not just a permanent thing for the day and, and he's now off the air. I mean, actually right now it's like 9.30 in, in the UK at night. So, um, so it's getting late over there. Uh, there is so much going on. It's absolutely insane. And uh, I guess, you know, he does go to the Bilderberg meetings, by the way. And, uh, and he's been doing that for many years. So he probably and a small team go over there. Um, sometimes they have some interesting reports. And I think they do document their visits to the Bilderberg meetings. Uh, I, as he said, I guess they're not let in on the actual meeting. So they, they're they like the reporters that hang about outside. I guess that's how it goes. Um, if, 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 if anyone has, uh, I'm like I said, I'm going to be on a show later today. So I hesitate to start going off on a tangent. Um, what does this say here? Everything gets watched. Yeah, everything goes on Rumble after I broadcast anyway. Um, so Clyde Barrel, I mean, that guy, you know, was uh, putting pornographic stuff up there and saying all kinds of horrible things. Uh, that's not going to fly in the chat. So if you didn't know that, someone sent me that stuff and gave me a heads up. So thank God I got rid of him from my telegram chat um that's kind of like a no-brainer maybe you didn't know that or maybe you're a fan of his <laughs> i don't know that's very weird so not really a question to do with anything worthwhile that was someone else well their name was clyde Bar barrel that was their signature on the on the chat so that's the bottom line they under that name, they were doing porno and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so let's see, what else? What do you think happened in Miami uh, with the whole aliens and the shopping mall? <laughs> well, I have talked about it already, but uh, I can say that I think it was a part of a um, kind of a public conditioning. It's part of this whole group of events that has been going on, which one was a sighting in Colorado, uh, like not Colorado, but where was it? Was it Colorado? Well, some state. No, I, I guess it was, I think maybe it was Nevada. Yeah, I think Nevada. I'm not sure. At a home. And that was on, that's on the internet. And then there was the one down in Peru. And I actually had some direct dealings with a person who went down there to investigate. I gave them a lot of advice on how to release their footage of their investigation of a similar type tall alien thing down there. Where I think she survived, but she had some harm done to her. And that's a very strange story, but it does not, is not fictitious. Uh, and then in an exact parallel, um, I don't know, what do you call those, uh, those lines uh, around our globe? I guess the horizontal one, there's vertical, vertical and horizontal. Anyway, on the same axis point going over to Florida to that mall was, was actually on the same line for what it's worth. And um, I, I think it was a Project Blue Beam beginning, rough start, 
uh, all the police showing up. I mean, that was just insane. Not even that many police showed up on 9-11, let alone on that in that situation. I think getting the cell phone footage seemed to be a desperate move by the, those police. And I think that indicates that there was something to be photographed that was worth seeing and could really have been uh, not just a blue beam situation, but maybe the actual some real aliens. I had suggested that the tall whites who have a, a base in, um, what's it called? It's, it's in Nevada, um, I think right on the border over there um, and, or kind of, and it's uh, this Charles Hall. There's a char series of books by uh, a military guy called Charles Hall about the tall whites, their society. He got to know them. He was based out there by himself for many years as a soldier. He was supposed to report on the weather or something out there, supposedly. But um, he ended up, and I tried to interview him, but his handler, who is his wife, wouldn't allow me. But anyway, I found out, I read all his books and um, and I found out that the uh, they love to shop in Vegas and, and wear the clothes and stuff. And they can kind of camouflage themselves other than being tall. They have quite long whitish hair. And quant contrary to a lot of people out there who think they're Nazis, they're not. So there's a confusion on the, the beings from Aldebaran are a different race of beings altogether. So it's, they're not Nazis, but the tall whites that Charles Hall talked about um, do love to shop and dress up in clothes. So I was joking around that it's possible they came down. Maybe they even got hired to come down and, and sort of put on a little show for, you know, the locals, so to speak, in the mall. Um, and then it was a test run. Now, I think it was Juan O'Savin who said it was a mapping exercise to see I guess, I don't know how people would react, where they would come from in different parts of Florida. And then he said they're planning another one of those to come along. So that's very interesting. I'm not lying, you know, <laughs> I tell him the absolute truth. This is absolutely what's out there. This is my thoughts. You don't agree with me. That's one thing, but I'm not fucking lying. So, you know, fuck off and I'll probably have to ban you. Uh, but at any rate, this is, um, you know, this is what's going on. There is an effort to do these, these, these things are all reported in the press. If you think they're lies, well, then blame the press. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and so anyway, it's all out there, mil million videos uh, all about this story. And I'm just telling you what my take is. So I think it's both. I think that it's both Project Bluebeam orchestrated and that possibly, not definitely, but possibly the tall whites might've come down uh, to, to also come through portals and, and put on some kind of demonstration. Otherwise, why did they want people's cell phones so desperately? And why were there so many police there? Because you didn't need a police presence, presence like that. So I think that's really fascinating. Um, what else? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, this is, um, you know, if you have, uh, it's nothing to do with telling the truth. It's, a, it's to do with harassment. When I'm relating a story that's out there told everywhere, it's not a lie. So the person doesn't know what they're talking about. Their brain is like frozen up and they've lost the plot. So yes, I will ban a person like that for sure. Um, but whatever else, uh, if you have any good questions and other than snide comments and trolling, uh, please do let me know. Otherwise, uh, I guess we'll, we'll close this down because it doesn't look like, uh, let me double check and see if I got any answers. No, Tony is not able to come back sadly. So We'll do this again another day if we can manage it with Tony. Uh, and so don't know what's going on, but this same thing happened with ML a few days ago. So something weird going on where they don't want these people to talk to me. So take care. Have a good 
day, night, and, uh, you know, try to keep your investigations going, try to do your own research, try to stay up to speed on what's happening and use your intuition and use your head, your mind coupled with your heart, your heart, a very important part of this. And anyone who spends time attacking someone, whether it's a live show or comments, that person has a really long way to go in developing self-esteem and becoming a, a good person, in my opinion. So take care again and have a good night. Bye-bye. Great. Kerry wants to do 20 minutes here, so you know that's perfect. Okay, uh, so sorry about this. Um, I have to go to Facebook to see if we're actually live because they're not, Facebook is not operating the way it's supposed to. So I've just, it's like manual. I go to, to check it out. So stand by. Okay, I think we are live again, and wow. um, and and so yeah, so so go right ahead, Tony. Uh, if you want to pick up where you left off, or, yeah. Well, or we we to... were before we were rudely interrupted by my battery draining from forty percent uh, down, even whilst the phone's being charged. Uh, uh, let's just leave it at that. Um, the uh, was we were talking about Charlie. Uh, we call him Tampon Charlie. I don't know if, yeah. if you, you know what we're talking about. Most of the world remembers the tapes uh, that were released probably through MI5 at the time, which was the sort of rival factions in MI5, some of whom supported Diana and some of whom supported Charles. Uh, and the, the famous tape of Charles talking about wanting to be a tampon uh, uh, when he was chatting with Camilla. Uh, so this is back in the 19... Oh, gosh, yeah, early 19, or mid-1990s. Uh, so Charlie, I think, is, you know, he's very much in charge. If you think, of course, he's also extremely active in this whole zero carbon movement, which is this attempt to create an entirely new economy uh, to control world energy and basically to control people's use of energy. So to turn it into not, not just a sort of... a, a in a world market in oil, coal, gas, whatever, but an entirely controlled uh, energy market. So you will only have a certain amount. This is very much like the Chinese social credit system. So Charlie is at the apex of that and always has been actually right the way since the Rio Earth Summit. So, you know, he's quite an important key figure. His main uh, organisation, I believe he operates through, is called the Order of the Garter, uh, which we now have uh, his wife, Camilla, uh, who the Queen didn't really want. She didn't go to their wedding. I don't know if you know that. When uh -huh. Camilla and Charles finally got married, the Queen refused to go because she said, this woman, uh, you know, because you cheated on Diana, you cannot actually have this woman properly as a, officially as, as the Queen uh, because you cheated on Diana. If Diana had cheated on you, fine. But this is the, this is the way the Queen saw it when she was alive. So, so you see, he's, he's not only involved in this very much in the foreign policy issues around helping Sunak appoint Cameron. He's also uh, extremely involved in this whole climate business with Klaus Schwab and his buddies uh, right. at the World Economic Forum, which is, so of course, I, is where I, the Chinese and the Americans come together there as well. Yes. Well, from our perspective, uh, he is a pedo, and uh, so is the entire royal family, reptilians, basically. And um, I, I don't need to go too much deeper into that. I well, think look, we hang on. So, yeah, well, that, okay, let, me, let me pick you up on that, because Andrew is an interesting character. Prostitute, basically, who was, I think she was 17 years old. Am I right? Uh, this is normal. I mean, it's not illegal. But the point of this whole Epstein operation well, was to blacken the names of anybody that's to do. The idea sure. is everybody is looking at the, uh, who's been to in, under the Epstein umbrella and they're being blackmailed. And they all look at um, Andrew and say, God, if they can do that to Andrew, what will they do to me if I don't toe the line? You know, so it is a Mossad 
uh, based, I think Mossad anyway, you know, uh, bot based uh, blackmail operation there. Sure, but with um, <laughs> with with actually some reality behind it. Uh, but I think that maybe you are not sort of, um, I don't know whether you're read in to, to the whole Satanism uh, and, and England has been front and center in the whole satanic uh, movement, of course. So it? For, for eons. Oh yeah. So you've well, I mean, never you know, gotten look, into the I occult do, and, uh, and, I, I, and I do see a lot of these things as ultimately satanic, particularly Freemasonry. Yes. And uh, things like the Order of the Garter, I think I would use, and even the British Army Council, which is always made up of Freemasons, this is the little organisation ever since Cromwell, which has run right. the army. So this is, I think, ultimately satanic. But I'll be interested to see why you think it's so focused here in Britain. Oh, well, it's it goes way back into the occult and all of that. Aleister Crowley, you name it, uh, the Dark Magicians. And also centred in... Um, in, in France, in uh, down in south of France, uh, God, what do they call it? The um, I think I'm drawing a blank right now. The P2 Lodge, is it? Oh, in P2? Italy, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. No, well, there's a, there's a base in France, anyway, and there are these witches, and the whole Illuminati is actually the whole government's run by behind the scene by these dark magicians, yeah. and uh, well, if I'd you've never gotten into the that. occult. And it doesn't have to be something which is weird and, and, and controversial. You just look at the P2 scandal in Italy, you'll find the chief fascist list. Yeah, the P2 Italy. Lodge. Yeah, but it's actually, uh, they have a base in, in southern France. But this is the thing is with the Italian lot, it, is it was all exposed in, in the, on the newspapers and everything over there. So you could see it. For, it's almost like a kind of... Uh, one of my witnesses, spotlight. Leo Zagami, are you familiar with him? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he talks a lot about it. He's written many books about it. I interviewed him. Uh, I was one of the first back in the day mm. to bring the whole thing public. But, but hang it, on. it did goes you know, into the... Sorry? Did you know about the, uh, the, the uh, original writings of the Illuminati from the late 1700s actually do talk about these propaganda lodges? I mean, yes. you know, it's amazing, amazing, really. If you, if you look, there's... Oh, yeah. All across the world, all across the press. Well, it uh, has to secret... do with the, you know, burning at the stake of, uh, you know, the the Templars and um and I mean, there's so many, there's so many facets of it. Yeah, uh, it's you know, but be that as may, rather than go down that direction, let's let's just sort of acknowledge that it is part of. Um, and I have some witness testimony about this going way back, uh, as well. Anyway. Well, hang Where on. Because are can, you, well, whilst we talk about the satanic, and it has to do with UK, satanic. Also, it has yeah. a lot to do with Israel. You know the background behind what is in the Khazarian mafia. You know it goes behind the all of this. I mean, this is a whole big story. The Drenochrome, I call it the Drenochrome Highway, it goes to Hollywood. Goes, you know, it it involves the the whole Epstein story, the islands, not just Epstein, but also uh, Branson and others. Uh, where these things are going on. Yeah. Well, look, uh, so we, we had a bit of a disagreement, didn't we, before I got cut off about uh, about accelerationism or problem re reaction solution. And I think this, you know, I really love to try and persuade you that this is really about ac an accelerationism is something which goes much deeper than this. I mean, Ike is quite right about the idea of of, of this but well this i i would i just don't use that word no, i mean but, but, we, no, we but consider they do. it the plan it I'm is the new it's, world order plan it's, it's, they do and it opens a door to this whole nietzschean philosophy uh which is so important i think to, and, and also links back to crowley people like him you know so that is what they do that is actually never mind what the problem reaction solution is what we're seeing accelerationism is what is creating those events and and the the thing they're accelerating is Armageddon. That's their their yes. Aim. I I, and, I think we agree completely and, on and, that. And so there is a philosophical movement now. Just to, to break it to you, one of my school friends uh, in Southeast London at Grammar School, Langley Park School in Beckenham in Kent, when I was 14, 15 years old, is this guy Nick Land. Now, Nick is the father of accelerationism. So I mean, I've, <laughs> this is something I've kind of figured out over the last couple of years is that my old school friend we used to call him 
Well, I didn't. I was a bit more polite, but he was called Nick the Nazi at school, oh. and uh, and and he's he's uh, he's he went on to uh, do philosophy uh, at Sussex University, mm-hmm. and uh, and then on to be a professor of or a lecturer anyway. He was he was a big fish in the philosophy world in the Nietzsche philosophy world at Warwick University, mm-hmm. where he created something called the Cybernetics uh, Cultural. Oh, God. Research- research unit right yeah. so this was a this brought in people from all over the world to look at effectively transhumanism right this is the idea of well and it also people into machines and yeah this is you've got Yuval Noah Harari now making millions out of writing books about this stuff but Nick was one of the first and it, I, I just found it crazy Kerry that you know and he was actually a really nice guy he was he was a very dark <laughs> character right? oh no but he was a brilliant guy to go to school with because he knew far more than any teacher in our school, uh, probably most of the lecturers at any of the universities. And I, you as know, a sort cybernetics, of boy, got into Scientology. That that that's also where it comes from. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, Nick Nick is one of the people who's actually behind this. I mean, okay. his writing is almost indecipherable, really. And, well, you know, uh, Scient- Scientology is a huge uh, got. Hugely into I don't, look, I don't think he was a Scientologist. He's writing about turning everything. I'm not so into sure computers. you can separate the two. Computers will run everything. And yeah. actually, this is the best way to do things. So he's saying, you well, know, that's like, where we are. This week with uh, Elon Musk's first implant person, which I think should oh. actually have been Elon Musk himself but uh, he's got some <laughs> idiotic volunteer to have a brain implant but this is yes. nick this is nick and his uh, accelerationist philosophies and if, right. you, if you want to really get get to grips with um you know his stuff don't read his stuff just look at what's going on i mean a person to read actually probably most useful is david livingston and his book about transhumanism uh, the, I'm all, the, you know, the, I report on transhumanism all the time. I that's mean, the right. COVID, well, David, the but David has got a really, thing. David, I think, has got the really long take that goes right back to literally like 2000 BC, looking at this movement to control everybody, you know, and bit by bit they've decided, and I think now they've just decided, right, we're going to go for it with uh, oh, with sweet. computer technology, with AI. And we're yes. going to have all these people, as, you know, this is through uh, owning nothing and being happy, of course. So of everybody course. is going to be. Yeah, no, it, like, it's a package deal. Yeah, mm-hmm. social credited. But the accelerationists are the people who've devised the system. What I'm saying is that, um, you know, all, all power to Ike's elbow in pointing out this problem reaction solution. But it's there is a much bigger, if you take a step back from it, I think it's a much bigger transhumanist. Well, okay, but I report on transhumanism all the time, and I've got article after article about this. I've been investigating this, and one of my main witnesses, Captain Mark Richards, has talked a lot about this. Well, you should. So I've really been breaking the story more than most people. See if you can interview Nick. I've tried. He won't. You know, he won't do an interview with me. But you might. What's his last name? Nick Land. Nick Land. Nick Land. Land. L A N D. And he's in Shanghai oh, yeah. now. Okay. He's over in Shanghai. Well, uh, I'll look him up and see see what we see about him. A, he, he, you know, he if you can actually uh, get him on, that would be fantastic. But you know, he, the thing is, the thing is that the uh, the ultimate aim is this massive conflagration, it, and uh, I think we're getting you know we're getting closer and closer all the time. We, you know, so this is yeah, what it's, it's very it. similar. I, I don't know what you make. I mean, it's very similar to the Crusades. It's almost like the Crusades, they didn't quite, you know, succeed. There were a few years they they had the uh, kings, the Crusader kings in Jerusalem. Then they got booted out by, uh, you know, Saladin and the rest of them. And the whole thing was a con anyway from start to finish. You know, it was loads of massacres going on. And it was a lot of it was to do with the war between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church at the time, you know, Rome and Constantinople. But, Supposedly. But, but, yeah, well, it was. I mean, there was. I mean, the, the Orthodox well, Church was massacred. It's kind of like now, you know, on, right look. now. Constantinople was absolutely massacred by, by the Crusaders. Constantinople. They wanted to wipe out the Orthodox Church. And, of course, that, that kind of move, has moved to what is now Moscow, right? So <laughs> that, that fight has not finished, you know? Anyway, look, I know you want to get wrap up, Kerry, but thanks. Um, yeah, so, so let's let's have you talk a little bit about your recent work 
Mm. any recent books, articles you've been working on, uh, where your focus is right now. And if you want to throw in some more Bilderberg investigations, let me know. That would be yeah, good. Well, OK, so just to wrap up, I've got these three books out now, ebooks, but two of them are also paperbacks. So one okay. is the uh, it's called The Traitors of Arnhem, which is also a paperback. Now, that is uh, that is uh, an investigation of, of the links between the British and the Nazis. Uh, uh, during the during the massacres there in Europe in the trenches, but then he was then getting involved with uh, secret communications with Hitler's private secretary Martin Bormann uh, in, right. in 1944. So I did a whole book about that and looking at the Battle of Arnhem and why that was such a disaster. And the film of Bridge Too Far was such a you know because well, they, how, they, do they you, how do you how do you how did you paint? Churchill in the end how, did you see him as just a complex person or did you see him part of the Illuminati and that their, their plans for changing the face of Europe yeah. etc Dennis Wheatley uh, the great writer deception planner during World War II uh, Dennis Wheatley in his book The Devil and All His Works I think it's <laughs> 1972 has a little line about Churchill right? he said uh, he said, maybe that maybe Winston Churchill was a member of Adam Weishaupt's Illuminati. I would not be surprised if it were so. Now, mm -hmm. Wheatley knew Churchill, was working with Churchill. And the other thing is Churchill and Morton, who was really in charge? Uh, because uh, Desmond Morton lived at Crocken Hill in Kent, just not far from where I was brought up uh, and uh, in a little house. And then a few years later, who turns up and moves in next door? Uh, ah, Winston Churchill moved in to be next door to Morton. So you do wonder who was sort of um, in the driving seat, really. Uh, anyway, th that's really the, the links between Borman and Morton, I think, are fascinating. The other books are more sort of, uh, well, one is The Siege of Heaven Reader, which is uh, just a kind of anthology of secret government, which I think everybody can sort of flick through. It's almost like a coffee table book, you know. Oh, wow, uh -huh. look at this, you know. And so that's all sorts of stuff to do with... Uh, secret government all the way from the English Civil War right the way through to the assassination of Diana. And, you know, so I'm just trying to pick out all sorts of interesting, I mean, I do quite a bit on the Kennedy assassination too. I've got all the names of the people involved in that, the CIA, the oh, Chicago, right. some interviews, some good interviews, which I hadn't seen transcribed up anywhere, the stuff I'd seen on TV, which I just typed up. Anyway, so that's the Siege of Heaven reader. And then the Siege of Heaven is just a collection of my, Articles include, I think, the one of the latest was looking at the it and how it was actually Elizabeth I and her and John D that had this plan for the British Empire. So, where did the biggest empire the world has ever seen come from? Well, it came from Elizabeth I, it came from John D, and actually, the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich in London has dug out some of the original secret documents, the plans for the empire. And so I look at Cromwell's role in all that and the emergence oh, fascinating. of Freemasonry. Well, uh, I should really read your books because those are well, all areas I'm very interested in. Now, uh, as, as e-books, I'm happy to send send them out review copies to anyone that's going to give them a review. So okay. uh, I'll just ping that over to you afterwards, Kerry. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, now, what about this first one you were talking about, the one that focuses on Churchill? Oh, yeah, that's um, the, tra the Traitors of Arnhem. Uh, okay, and now the reason, the reason that the British, through that battle, loads of Americans were in Arnhem in, in September 1944, was to give the Germans more time, you know, to, to squirrel the wealth away around the world. Uh, and then oh. right at the very end, very end of the war, right. the guy, Bormann, who was the signatory on all the main Nazi bank accounts, was smuggled out of Berlin along yes. with canals under the noses of the Russians by, by British commandos and uh, to Desmond Morton, who was waiting in the British sector. And, oh, uh, hello, Mr. Bormann, thank you. Right, let's have all your money and we'll give you a nice new life. And they... Kept him in Britain for a little while, but he ended up uh, in South America setting up basically a Fourth Reich, a financial Fourth Reich. Uh, and that that is also an, um, one of the well, the two main books that I got most of this from. One is Op JB by Christopher Crichton, who was one of, the read that. one of the one of the commandos that went on that mission during the day and coming back and doing reports for Americans on the on the radio during World War Two. And Paul Manning's book, Martin Bormann, Nazi in Exile, explains where the money went really where all this and it was laundered through sullivan and cromwell 
law firm, you know, the Dallas Brothers law firm in New York, all this this billion dollars or so from looted from Europe and put into these companies, which are the, the sort of yes. fourth type we're dealing with today. That's right. Uh, fascinating. Um, now, do you follow uh, Michael uh, Shrimpton's work at all? A bit, yeah, bits and pieces. I've yeah. done some interviews with him over the years, sure, yeah. Have you, yeah. Because he, he, you know, he's very much into the whole yeah you know, nazis <laughs> that have infiltrated the uh what, both governments or three governments really the russians the the, the uk and the americans but especially yeah, the uk yes no i think i think he's he's right about britain being infiltrated definitely and he talks a lot about canaris you know the as opposed to hitler so yeah there's a lot I, I don't know if you're one of these people that buys into the hitler survived the war theory that all started once yes, this book actually. had been published. This is that all started once Op JB had been published because it was talking about Borman being protected by the right. British. And so I think, you know, we have to agree to disagree on that because right. I, I think they threw out all these Hitler survived things as a kind of cover for Borman, you know, because uh, this stuff would get out about. Uh, uh, you know, the British and the Nazis. But anyway, I just hope that, and I obviously didn't do this alone. There were various people that helped me along the way, Kerry. One guy particularly I ought to mention, Barry Wynn. He was a fantastic character. He was in the SAS in Malaya. Uh, he then came back to Britain and worked in ATV, which is one of the first independent television companies uh, on the Avengers series, doing, oh, publicity, really? <laughs> doing publicity for them in the 1960s. And I got to know Barry and he helped me with the research. He said he because he, he knew one of the intelligence officers that had been involved in uh, the Battle of Arnhem and had tried to stop the betrayal of all of the plans to the to the Nazis and been stopped, you know, basically. And, and this uh, uh, Areste Pinto was the guy's name. And um, so he'd, he'd actually had lunch with him. And he so he helped me on the way to, uh, you know, to piecing all these bits of the jigsaw together about how deeply the Brits were involved in uh, in taking the money that the Nazis had looted from Europe and investing it into this new Fourth Reich. Yes, absolutely. Um, now, can you spell uh, the battle battle of what's the last word? Oh, it's the Traitors of Arnhem, A-R-N-H-E-M. Which is this is the city in Holland, okay. which the battle was centered around. Actually, the battle was mainly centered around Nijmegen, really. But and it was where can about people... cr crossing the Rhine. If you can you can find that on uh, if you go to Bilderberg.org, you can get a link to buy it <laughs> buy it, or you can get uh, Okay, I'll do can, that. Yeah, you can get no listen, man. No, I'll, I'll send you a copy. You can get an <laughs> e-copy. E right. <laughs> That's fine uh, too. But, uh, I even do free ones which have got slightly degraded pictures in them and you can just download right. a new one or well, you can either buy an way, e uh, i'm happy to you know back. buy an ebook if you have an ebook for sale over there i'll, yeah. I'll do that too so it's all at bilderberg.org in fact everything is all right <laughs> excellent where it's all based yeah and right. my well, weekly glad... show i ought to say my weekly show is thisweek.org.uk which we've got a show on tomorrow right. we'll be talking about allotments because they're trying to destroy the allotments here in bristol the New World Order, the evil powers in the city are trying to right. kick people off their allotments. But then we'll also be going into a lot more of the serious national and international news as well, as we do every Friday. OK, very good. Uh, well, I'm glad we got back in touch with you, Tony. Sorry for the rush to have to go to another show. I've already got that book. That's fine. Look, um, listen, I'm sorry for, for my phone running. I've never seen it run down so fast. I mean, it no, is, it, it, you literally, know, it was we charging attacked. as well. Yeah, they didn't want you to say some of the things you were probably about to say. So, all right, love. Uh, well, it's nice right. to see you again, and thank you for having me on. Yeah, thank you for coming, and thanks everyone for watching and, and sticking with us. So, I'll put the two pieces together, one show, and put it on Rumble. So, stay see tuned. you next time. Cheerio, folks. All right, take care. Bye bye. Thanks, bye bye.